So, I'll use this this morning. You turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah chapter 26. And before we get into it any further, I'd like to wish uh, Brother Walt and Sister Joyce a happy anniversary. <laughs> Unless they had both had birthdays the same day. It's our anniversary. It's our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so we like to do that. And wish Sister Rob a happy birthday. Coming up this week. Yeah. Big one for her. <laughs> but I've been through it, so you can survive it. So, anyway. Do we have any testimonies or specials? Okay. Well, very good. Thank you, Sister Kaylee, for working on the bulletin for us there. That uh, makes it go along a little smooth, a little faster there. We can turn a second song a little quicker, doing it that way quite a bit quicker this morning. Uh, this man deserves to die. Jeremiah heard those words, and somebody's probably pointing a finger right at him. And he was thinking, oh my, I am in trouble now. Sometimes you would have the corrupt religious leaders that might be against you. Like in the case of Jesus, many times there were corrupt religious leaders against him. But the people loved him. And so there were, you know, there was, uh, they were held in check by that. But in this case, Jeremiah had someone say, you deserve to die. And it was the corrupt religious leaders and it was some of the corrupt officials, and it was the people. He said, oh, he's in trouble now. Well, how did he get here? It started out on this day that God came to him and told him to speak the words, and he said, speak only the words that I give you, and don't diminish them. And Jeremiah, in the past, found out that it was always best to just speak the way that God told him to speak. Now, it may not look like it was always best, and in this case, it didn't seem like it was going to be very good because they were saying, you deserve to die. But he knew that it was best to do that in the past. Serve God, obey God, and leave the consequences to him. And so he had done that on this occasion. So this day, the word of the Lord came to him, and he came to the court of the temple. This was an area apart from where they did the sacrifices and things. And it was like some of the early days of our country, they always talked about being on a soapbox. You would have a public area, like on a public street or sidewalk, they'd bring a soapbox where you could stand on top of it, be taller than the crowd that's around, and then you could... Uh, deliver your speech, whatever you wanted it to be. That was the area of the temple that they had where people could go and do that. So Jeremiah came. I don't think he had a soapbox. But he stood there in the court of the temple. Now he was hopeful because this message, even though he knew it could be an unpopular message, he was hopeful, though, because if the people would hear the message... And if they would repent of their sins, then God would not have to do the things that Jeremiah was going to have to talk about here. That God would not carry it out if they would repent. There's that little bitty word that's a great big word, if. And so he came and he brought the message to them. And he told them that if they would not listen to the word, then their house would this house, this temple where they were, would become like Shiloh. Now Shiloh was another place where they used to worship God. It was a, an earlier place of the house of the Lord. And God deserted that house because they didn't listen to him. And so he departed from there. And he was saying to this crowd, if you don't straighten up, if you don't repent, it's going to become just like that. So he mentioned the word Shiloh. And he also said that God will bring a curse on this city. Well, the worst happened. 
they would not repent. And the crowd joined the corrupt officials in saying, you will surely die. Well, so we see here, we see the accusation. We're going to see the defense. And we're going to see the result of that. So let's look at the accusation here. The first 11 verses kind of just telling you what the Bible actually said about what I, the story I just told you about. But here it is in Jeremiah chapter 26. And we see the accusation. It said, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the house of the Lord, and speak to all the cities of Judah, who come to worship in the house of the Lord, all the words that I command you to speak to them. Notice, that Jehoiakim was the son of Josiah. Josiah had a great revival whenever he was king, but Jehoiakim's reign was not going as well as that. And uh, so, and also that there were people that came from all around to other cities, so he wasn't just war, uh, speaking to that particular city. And speak to all the cities of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. All the words that I command you to speak to them, do not diminish a word. Perhaps they will listen and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent of the calamity which I purpose to do to them because of the evil of their deeds. There it's speaking of God repenting. Now, it's going to be different than the kind of repentance that you and I do. And repentance means to change the mind. Well, God knows what, you know, he doesn't change. But he did purpose this, that he was going to warn people. And he purposed that if they would listen and if they would repent, then he would not do the things that was going to be mentioned to them. And so he said there was hope. Perhaps they will listen. Because of the evil of their deeds, you will say to them, Thus says the Lord, If you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh. Uh, it'll be a house of the Lord where the presence of God is not there. And will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. And there it was. The message was delivered. There was the opportunity for them to hear and to turn from their sins. But instead they got mad. So... The priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. And when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, the priests and the prophets and all the people took hold of him, saying, You shall surely die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, this house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant. And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah... Okay, so you have the religious officials here. You, there were other prophets. Evidently, they weren't the right prophets <laughs> because they were opposing Jeremiah. You had the priests... And the people who heard this message, they all got angry. Well, so then the word comes to officials of the government that are in the palace of the king, Jehoiakim. And so they're going to come and to check this out and to find out what's going on. Now the Bible tells us that we are to be subject to those that are in authority, but it qualifies it. 
It says, For they are ministers of God to thee for good. Whenever the government, <laughs> whenever the people that are in authority are doing, ministering to you for good, then they are fulfilling their proper role. But when they're not doing that, and when they're doing the exact opposite of that, then they're not fulfilling their proper role. And I don't think the subjection to them is the same as it is when they're in their proper role. Well, in this case, you had King Jehoiakim and you had officials in the palace, and so they heard about this uproar going on over at the house of God. And so they went over to see what was going on. And fortunately, in this case, they were being ministers of God for good. We hope. <laughs> so here in verse 10, it said, When the officials of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets spoke to the officials and to all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Evidently, he was good. they got there in time to hear part of the message. And uh, so we have that. You have the accusation. Now, we know that there is one who goes about accusing. He is known as the accuser. He is Satan. He goes about seeking whom he may devour. And he goes about accusing the brethren. That's us Christians, brothers and sisters. And he goes about doing that. In this case, though, you had people accusing Jeremiah of something that he was not guilty of. All he did was proclaim the true word of the Lord. He proclaimed the truth. And they were saying that he deserved to die. And in our case, Satan can accuse us too. He can accuse us of sinning, of being sinners. And the problem is, in our case, it's true. Because the Bible says, that all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. So the great accuser wants to come and stand before God and says, Look, look at them. Look how they disobey your laws. Look at them. Look how they fall short of what you do. Look at them, how they have rebellion in their hearts. He can accuse us of all of those things. And so you have the accusations. Well, let's look here in the scripture, though. You had the defense. You start in chapter, uh, verse 12, down to verse 23. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that you have heard. Therefore, now, uh, now, <laughs> okay, so a little defense there. The Lord sent me to do this. And now is the opportunity again to <laughs> preach to them and the officials that are there. So there's no doubt that he said, Therefore, now amend your ways and your deeds, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here, I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and right to you. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears. So you have Jeremiah giving his own defense, and he said, The Lord sent me to do it. Now, now, look at verse 16. It says, Then the officials and all the people said to the priest and to the prophets, Okay, so now the people are changing their tune, right? And this man is not worthy of death, for he has spoken to us 
in the name of the Lord our God. So these officials came and the tide changed. They were being ministers of God for good. And now Jeremiah, it looked like that maybe he's not going to be put to death after all. And uh, so then one of them gets up and he gives them the example of why they should not put Jeremiah to death. Verse 17. Then certain of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now notice how similar this is to what Jeremiah said. The Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. And then they ask the question, did Hezekiah king of Judah and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the Lord and the Lord uh, relented of the disaster which he had pronounced against them? Thus we might procure great evil against ourselves. Oh, this is a pretty good defense. When I was getting up here and saying, all right, in the time of Hezekiah, Micah got up and preached this same message, and he said that if they would repent, then the land would not be made desolate. And they heard in the day of Hezekiah. So we should not put Jeremiah to death. And then they continue on with another example, though. And... Uh, this is in verse 20. There was also a man that prophesied in the name of the Lord, Uriah, or it reads Uriah in some versions, the son of Shephatiah of Kiriath, uh, Kiriath Jerem, who prophesied against this city and against this land according to all the words of Jeremiah. And when Jehoiakim, that's this king, when Jehoiakim, uh, the king, with all his mighty men and all the officials, heard his words. The king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went into Egypt. And Jehoiakim the king sent men into Egypt, namely El Nathan, the son of Akbor, and certain men with him into Egypt. They brought Uriah out of Egypt and led him to Jehoiakim the king, who slew him with a sword and cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. Wow, what about this defense? First one sounds pretty good. <laughs> Said, okay, now in the time of Hezekiah, you know, they wanted to put him to death, but instead they repented and, and God relented of what he was going to do. Now more recently, you've had Uriah and uh, you actually did put him to death. And so it's not looking good for Jeremiah. Are they going to go with the example of how good it was to not put the prophet to death in the time of Hezekiah? Or are they going to go ahead and carry out the sentence just like they did against Uriah? So he's not out of deep water yet. <laughs> well, just think about this, though. Here... You had an advocate, one who came and spoke on behalf of Jeremiah. And aren't you glad? You have the accuser. The accuser comes before God and says, he has sinned, she has sinned, and the wages of sin is death. The accuser comes, but aren't you glad that there is one who is an advocate with the Father? <laughs> that whenever we sin, whenever we fail, yeah, we're not to sin, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And he has great influence on the Father. And so he can come before God and say, kind of like this, they're with me. <laughs> they're with us. Uh, a friend uh, named Bill, he wrote a poem one time, and he talked about how uh, somebody was going somewhere and, and trying to get through the crowd. And it was like they were going to stop him all at once, but then there was this dignitary. And the dignitary says, oh, he's with me. 
And so they opened up and let him go right through. And Jesus is an advocate for us. Uh, if you repent of your sins, there's that word if again. If you repent of your sins, then Jesus can come and advocate before uh, you before the Father. And Jesus is our advocate. Okay, well then look at the deliverance. Then verse 24. You've had the, we just ended that, that bad part of the defense. You know, we killed Uriah already. But verse 24, nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah. He stood up for him. He was the advocate for Jeremiah, and he was very influential with the result that Jeremiah was not given into the hands of the people to put him to death. So you have, you have the hand of Ahikam that came and rescued Jeremiah. So it starts out that they say this man is worthy of death. And the crowd is swayed to that. Most of them say that. And then the officials come being ministers of God for good. And the crowd begins to sway away from that a little bit. Wishy-washy crowd, right? And then they come up and they give a good defense, and then they give another example that doesn't sound quite so good. But you have the influential Ahikam that says, I stand for Jeremiah, and he was not put to death. Well, Jesus is our protector. Um, we, Rhonda and I were talking with Rolanda, I think it was yesterday, and uh, we were reminded of the story, of a, a true story, right, of a man who was known as uh, Brother Yun, or you might pronounce it Yun, I don't know, it's Y-U-N. But he had a nickname. He was known as the Heavenly Man. So one time he was arrested, and he was tortured. And I mean, he, and he's a Christian, you know, that heavenly man. But he's arrested, he was tortured, and they beat him, and they beat his legs so mercilessly that he could hardly walk. And he was in prison, and Jesus came to him. It may have been in a vision, or it was like he saw Jesus. And Jesus came to him and said, I'm going to come and get you. But he didn't get him right then. But he said, I'm going to come and get you. And just a day or two later, it was like the, the door opened to the room. You couldn't see anyone, but he knew that it was Jesus that had come to get him. And it was like Jesus said, get up and go. Get up and go. And so he got up and he walked toward that open door. And there was no one around. He came to another door that was open, and there were people around. But they didn't say anything as he walked through it. He went through another door. Nobody said anything. And before he knew it, he was outside of the prison. He looked around, and there on the street was a taxi cab. He felt impressed. He walked down to the taxi cab. The driver opened the door. said, get in. He got in the car. And he drove to this house where there were people who had been praying for five days or so that he would be released. And so he got there, and, and they had got the word from the Lord the day before that he indeed was going to be released. And they believed it so much, they knew that he liked chicken and dumplings. They started making chicken and dumplings, and he showed up at the house. He was going to stay there. I know I'm preaching now, chicken and dumplings. <laughs> and he got there and they said you know they may come after you here and if they do we want you to know we have a bicycle out back so you can slip out the back and you can get away on that bicycle and so he went out the back door to test it out and he got on the bicycle and he was riding and all of a he realized his legs are okay Jesus is our protector Jesus is the one who can watch over us. You had the deliverance there. But more than that, it's great 
to get physical healing in this life. It really is great. But I, I know the uh, friend, a preacher friend one time, he's going to someone that had cancer. And he's going to pray for him to be healed. But he said to him, I would rather see you eat up with cancer and go to heaven than for you to be healed now and not know the Lord. So the, Jesus is our protector, and sometimes he brings in unusual things like he did in the case of Brother Young. Uh, other times there are those of us that God just allows us to persevere and just make it on to this life. And uh, we make it through the troubles and trials that come our way. And uh, what's that song? Troubles and trials will soon be done. <laughs> but he is our Savior. Amen. And whenever you think about eternity, this life is just a drop in the bucket compared to all eternity. That's not to say it's not severe and it doesn't hurt. You don't have things that are really hurtful and, and harmful in this life. That's not to minimize that. But it is to maximize eternity. That if you make it through this life, it'll be worth it. And you'll spend all eternity with the Lord. Well, so you had the accusation, the defense, and the deliverance. And you have Satan who accuses us that we have sinned. And the problem is we have sinned. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But it also says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it says that if we will repent of our sins and believe and put our faith and trust in Jesus, we shall be saved. And regardless of whatever we have to face in this life, we will have eternity to spend with God. It will be a wonderful thing. So what should we do? I'm going to ask our musicians to come. We're going to sing a song here. But what should we do? If God impresses upon us to speak his word, or impresses upon us to speak the word of God that's in the Bible, to speak the truth of the word, I think that we ought to be willing to speak the truth and to leave the consequences to God. Now, there are those, like Uriah, he spoke the truth, and he did get put to death. But then, many times, God will come and deliver like he did for Brother Young. Regardless, we ought to speak the truth and leave the consequences to God. But the other thing is, most of all, accept Christ as your Lord and Savior.